Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Woodburn Accountants and Advisors November webinar series all about procurement in China. For those of you that have joined my series in the past, my focus has very much been on sales into China, predominantly because of the pandemic and that being the biggest opportunity that's out there right now. With supply chains being as they are, I thought, why not bring in a session on procurement in China just because people are still procuring and sourcing in China, but not only China, in the Asian market in general. And since it's a topic I haven't done in quite a number of years, because it's, it's something that people generally don't speak about, I thought I would bring that in for um, the month of November. So just to give you a heads up, today we're gonna be talking about the direct import program. We're gonna be talking a little bit about the common pitfalls in sourcing. Um, and basically the business models that exist. Tomorrow, we've got a guest speaker who's coming in to talk about all logistical things. So I saw in the registration form that a couple of people had questions on supply chains and how supply chains are going to be improving over the next six months to a year. Please save that question for tomorrow for Simon because he's the expert on the logistical side of everything. On Wednesday, we've got the Hong Kong Trade Development Council who's going to be popping in um, to talk about Hong Kong as a sourcing hub. And then on Thursday, again, quite a hot topic is how to mitigate the currency risk as you are trading with China. The focus for Thursday will be on procurement, um, but there will also be a component about the sales aspect because you know in, in China, it's, you, you don't do one without the other. So um, I just wanted to mention that. So as is usual, I always want to know a little bit about my audience. There are a couple of new people that are on here today that I'm not familiar with. Those that know me, you guys don't need to answer this, but those that are new, it would be great to know at what stage you are at in your China, if not Asia development. Are you a newbie in China? Are you a startup in Asia? Are you an experienced China hand in Asia? If you could just type that in the chat box, newbie, startup, or experienced, that would be brilliant because I love to know a little bit about the newcomers that are coming on to the series. And again, here it's specific to China, but if, if you are you know, a newbie to Asia in general, um, particularly because today's session, we're gonna be talking about not just sourcing in China, but sourcing in Asia in general, um, then add that in as well. All right, so how the webinar works, for those of you who know this already, apologies, but I've got to repeat myself. I'm here to educate you. Um, I will indirectly be selling you stuff today, apologies, but that is part of the direct import program. It's a program that us as a service provider, we have created for those companies that are sourcing and procuring in Asia. Um, there are thousands of other service providers who offer the same type of business model. I just want to mention it there. So I've used Woodburn as the example. Um, so that's the only selling I'll be doing. Um, but through that, I will be educating you on what possibilities there are to create business models in Asia when you're talking about sourcing and procurement, okay? And what are the advantages around doing those? This is your time spend. Use it wisely. We will have a Q&A at the end of today's session. Please drop in all the questions and comments you might have, um, and I will get to those during the Q&A. All right. I did read through the registration form. I saw a couple of questions that were popping in. If you've got supply chain, supply chain questions, please save those for tomorrow with our logistics expert um, from LF Logistics, Simon. If you've got currency questions, please save them for Isabel on Thursday. If you've got questions about the actual program and the trade flow, save that for today. Um, this should not be longer than 60 minutes, I hope, but I did book you in for 90 minutes, so bear with me um, as, I, as I go through the slides. All right, just from a technical standpoint, we're using Zoom meeting. I'm speaking. I've got no other colleagues on here with me. If you guys run into any issues, um, apologies. We are recording today's session. You'll be able to see the recording later on our YouTube channel. Uh, my only suggestion is log off, log back in to see if that works. Uh, if I run into any technical issues, which I hope I don't because nobody else is in the house today, um, so nobody is, is taking away from my broadband, 
Um, just bear with me. It usually takes about a minute to 90 seconds for me to re reboot the system and then log back in. I will be coming back in to finish today's session. Um, so if you have time and stay on, um, if not, I completely understand, watch the recording later on. Just a little bit about myself. My name is Christina kohler Colucci. I'm the head of business advisory at Woodburn Accountants and Advisors. We are a corporate services firm um, where we help to set up, administer, and maintain companies that are incorporated in the two jur jurisdictions of Hong Kong and China. My brother, who is not a fan of speaking in front of people, has put me in charge of this week's series, which is actually all about Hong Kong. Um, I'm actually the expert on China. My brother is the expert on Hong Kong. I do know quite a lot and I'll be sharing as much as I know as is possible um, during today's presentation. But that is how we split ourselves. Sven, who's my brother and is co-founder with me is based in Hong Kong. Um, he's our managing director, helping all of our clients that have Hong Kong entities. Um, I'm normally based in Shanghai, but due to the pandemic, I'm currently in Europe and I administer, maintain all companies that are incorporated in mainland China. What we do is our focus is 100% on foreign investors that are looking to do business in Hong Kong and China, as well as in Asia, as you will see from today's presentation, all right? But where we deliver services is purely in Hong Kong and in China. We, I personally have over 17 years of experience in corporate services and corporate compliance. Um, I am a public speaker on the topic of doing business in China um, and how to do business in China securely in order to protect yourself. We have created over the years certain methodologies that have helped companies um, to really think about creating solid foundations for their transactions and their organizations in China and in Hong Kong. And you're more than welcome to look at those methodologies that are up on our website or are also up on our YouTube channel. And last but not least, before we start today's session, um, if you are interested in getting a copy of our ebook or you haven't received it yet, we have written an ebook on the 10 biggest mistakes companies make in China. This is my opinion of the 10 biggest mistakes. Of course, I've also expanded that to the 100 biggest mistakes, but these are the 10 biggest ones that I see as being obstacles for a lot of foreign investors as they're developing their businesses in the Asian market. And if you are interested in getting a copy, email me at christina at woodburnglobal.com and you can get a free copy of this ebook. It might be a nice little Christmas uh, read um, as there are quite, quite, quite a nice uh, few fun episodes in there, case studies in there. So as of this week, we have four sessions. Today is episode one about developing a direct import program from Asia using Hong Kong. Keep in mind, the topic is around procurement and sourcing. At the end, I will talk a little bit how you can add sales into there, but predominantly we are looking at procurement and sourcing. And I wanna say again, if you missed it, this is a topic I have not touched on in years. I don't even remember the last time I spoke about procurement and sourcing, mainly because that's history. Um, I don't want to say it's something that's old fashioned because everybody is still sourcing and procuring in Asia, but it's just a topic that isn't really discussed as much because everyone is thinking about how to sell into China. They're talking about cross-border e-commerce. They're talking about retail, wholesale, and how to get consumers and wholesalers to buy from them, right? That's what everybody is talking about. And because of the supply chain disruptions that have been occurring, due to the pandemic, I thought it would just be good to retouch on the topic of sourcing and procurement and how you can create efficient structures in Hong Kong, for example, although mind you, you could do that in Singapore too. We don't have an office there, hence I'm promoting Hong Kong um, this week, on how you can use Hong Kong to consolidate your procurement and sourcing initiatives in Asia. Because what we have also found is that China is not the sole jurisdiction where you might be sourcing any longer. You might be sourcing now also from Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, Japan, Korea. It, it's expanded, right? The world of sourcing has truly expanded as the prices of manufacturing goods has increased in China. 
So how can you create this efficient structure? How can you create something where things are consolidated and you're consolidating shipments so they go direct to your customers globally, all right? Before I start on the direct import program though, I wanna talk about options to source in China. What, what are people doing to source in China and or Asia, right? Again, I, I wanna reflect more on Asia as a sourcing hub versus just China, because that is what we are seeing in today's world. So obviously the first thing I wanna hi highlight, which is the traditional way, is sourcing in Asia with no local representation. What does that mean? It basically means that you are procuring goods from the Asian market, whether that's China, Vietnam, Hong Kong, wherever, and you are exporting that and importing that into your own home jurisdictions, if not selling that direct to customers, okay? That's traditionally how everything is happening, and especially for new people that are, are starting to procure goods in Asia, this is what you're gonna be doing. Why? Because you might not have the resources immediately available to set up your own entity in Asia, send expatriate staff, or even have the budget to hire local individuals to help you build that sourcing structure, okay? Now, the issue with sourcing with no local representation is the fact that times have changed. We are living in a world currently where borders are shut. And unfortunately, the strictest borders that are shut are in Asia. I don't wanna say just China, because if you look at the legislations in Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, Hong Kong, they are very similar to those with China. So for me, currently living in Europe, Asia in general is like no man's land. It is extremely, extremely difficult to get into those jurisdictions, into those countries to vet suppliers, to control suppliers, to control products that are being produced, to control quality, to control lead time. It is hard, okay? And obviously all of this relates to what the volume of your business is in Asia for sourcing and procurement, okay? And the, the downside currently over the last 18 months is that people have been feeling a lack of loyalty, a lack of transparency and a lack of control through the local sourcing agents, logistical providers, and ultimately the manufacturers that are producing the goods, okay? Now, Obviously, if you don't have the budget, this is the way to go. You have to source with no local representation, okay? And at the end of today's presentation, I'm going to be providing you with how to avoid the most common pitfalls if this is the business model you're going to be choosing to procure and source in Asia, all right? But basically, you need to build up a network of logistics providers. You need to build up a network of manufacturers you need to probably also build up a network of import export agents and a network of manufacturers, right? And my philosophy is this, we don't wanna put all of, all of our eggs in one basket. We need to have backup plans in case prices start st skyrocketing, in case quality goes down. We need to have backups in place that we can quickly change providers so that we are not paying an arm and a leg for something that we can't control properly in current times, okay? Let's wait off on that because I'll be touching on avoiding the most common pitfalls at the end. I just wanna highlight here, obviously a case study because I think people compute case studies much easier. Um, we had a Spanish SME client who was on a very tight budget. They did not have the capital investment to establish a structure locally. The volume of business was not at the level, at the KPI level or the trigger point level that they needed to be able to warrant setting up an office with people in there, whether that be in Hong Kong, whether that be in China, whether that be in another jurisdiction. Um, so what they did is, is they did, again, sourcing direct from their head office in Spain. They have a team of procurement specialists in their head office that in normal times would travel to Asia for important trade shows, to meet all the various manufacturers, suppliers, 
use those opportunities to negotiate purchase orders, do quality control tests, et cetera. But with the pandemic, that is 18 months now, almost two years because March was, was the lockdown in Europe. Um, so almost two years where there's been zero travel. And let's face it, negotiating quality, well, quality control tests are impossible, but negotiating and doing the quality control tests and negotiating lead times and all of that, it's difficult, right? Not to mention the fact that manufacturers in China don't have proper raw materials that they can't obtain. I mean, the whole supply chain is in a havoc and the fact that you cannot physically be on the ground is making things worse. So companies have had to pivot and they've had to pivot to the fact that they've had to outsource certain functions of the procurement and sourcing to experts that are on the ground, okay? Whether that be, I don't know, SGS for the quality control, um, sourcing agents who have expertise in your products and can do not only the negotiations with suppliers, find new suppliers, but also then do maybe quality control testing as well. People have had to pivot, okay? The other one I want to highlight is in relation to trademarks because people think that if they're not selling in a jurisdiction and they're not doing any brand marketing in a jurisdiction, it means that there is no need for them to register a trademark. All right. I would beg to differ. Even if you are purely sourcing in Asia, I don't know, China, Vietnam, you need to register the brand assets that are being put on your product, on your packaging, whatever else it might be. The reason why I say this is because we had a situation and we've had many situations where a company can have over a hundred suppliers, have a falling out with one of those suppliers who then in order to um, gain power and leverage registers the trademarks not just with the CTMO office, which is the China Trademark Office, but also with the customs office. And as a consequence, when goods are being exported, they are halted at customs because the trademark ownership belongs to that one local supplier. Now, in this situation, the court case went to court. Um, what they could export were items that didn't have the logo or the brand assets on them. Anything that did was halted at customs and could not be exported, which means bad image to your customers. If you're selling to retailers, this is terrible. You know, you, you need to protect yourself. So I just wanna say, even if you are purely sourcing and procuring in China, in any other Asian jurisdiction, please make it a priority to register your trademarks in those jurisdictions so you don't get into these situations that can ultimately halt your business for up to six months, especially if it goes to court. This is just an administrative process and people don't think about it because they say, well, we're not doing any marketing, we're not branding, well, why should we? Because of this, okay? So please, please, please make that a priority. Now, the other type of business model you can create is to use a local sourcing agent in the jurisdictions in Asia that you are looking to focus on, right? Now, obviously, uh, in the world that we live in, it is not easy to find sourcing agents that are dedicated, that are reliable, that are professional, that are credit worthy, right? You're not physically seeing them on the ground. You don't even know if they're real. So I understand the difficulties that are around there, but again, I'm just sharing with you another type of business model, right? where obviously you can create protective me measures where you have secure contracts in place that worst case scenario, you cancel and exit those contracts and work with other local sourcing agents, okay? Now the difficulty with finding sourcing agents is that you might find import export agents that purely do the trade. So you still have your network of manufacturers and they're just this intermediary buying agent that buys and sells and they get a commission and that's it. Alternatively, um, you can work with manufacturers that might also have export licenses. So they would have the ability um, to trade on your behalf. Um, but the issue here, what's the downside? The downside is obviously that if you are looking to sell direct from Asia to your customers abroad, 
then the paperwork will reflect who your suppliers would be or would reflect who your import export agent would be. And it could very well then be that your customers remove you as that middleman, right? And they don't need you anymore because they know who is the ultimate producer. Even though the design might be yours, unless you patent that design, they can go direct to the various suppliers, right? So you got to keep this in mind in terms of the pros and the cons of working with intermediaries like these sourcing agents who are there acting as a certain function to do quality control, to find new suppliers, whatever else it might be. Um, and again, making sure you've got very, very solid contracts in place that should there be a breach, you can exit that relationship. Um, case study here, um, we were working with a French pharmaceutical company that at the time prior to establishing their Hong Kong company, they were working with about 25 different sourcing agents because they didn't want to put all their eggs in one basket. And the agents had different functionalities. They had agents specific, specific to jurisdictions. So agents in China, Vietnam, Malaysia, etc. They had agents specific to product lines. Um, and Obviously, prior to COVID, they had their procurement team traveling from France to Asia to negotiate again with the agents, check up on the agents, test the products, vet them, just catch up generally with them. And obviously, this has changed. Um, so in this scenario, they actually set up their own Hong Kong company. And through that Hong Kong company, they had a team on the ground that was able to facilitate and work with maintaining some of these agents, deleting some of the others, but working then directly with the manufacturers. So let me tell you a little bit about the direct import program using Hong Kong. What does it actually mean? And again, you do need to have um, the financial resources available uh, and generally the time resources available to establish such an entity, okay? What does it mean? And I've put this diagram here because I hope it explains perfectly the concept to you. Now, as I said earlier, we have our business in Hong Kong, so I'm using Hong Kong as the example, but there are a lot of companies who have their supplier network in Southeast Asia. And so instead of Hong Kong, they use Singapore as an alternative. You need to evaluate where in Asia is your supplier network and see whether Hong Kong makes sense for you or whether Singapore would make sense for you. But both jurisdictions can apply within this program. We don't sell Singapore, we only sell Hong Kong. So that's, that's why we're using Hong Kong as the example. So basically, what does it mean? It means that you have, and I didn't put it in this diagram because um, I didn't want to complicate it too much, but you have a to on top of Hong Kong, your um, headquarter that is in your own home jurisdiction, whether that is in the UK, whether that's in Germany, whether that's in the US, that sets up this subsidiary in Hong Kong, acting as your regional sourcing hub, okay? Now, what does this mean? It means that from that headquarter, you are transferring work to be done on the ground in the region in the same time zone. So you've got your new Hong Kong company, which now is the communicator to your suppliers in China and in Asia. And you've got your new Hong Kong company, which is the communicator with end customers. Okay, so if your company is called XYZ UK Limited, your Hong Kong company might be called XYZ Hong Kong Limited right, to maintain the brand and for customers to realize they're actually buying from you, but from your regional Asian office, all right? And you can see here the paperwork, right? Purchase order from your customers go to Hong Kong, purchase order then goes to the supplier. Invoice goes from the supplier to Hong Kong, which then goes to the customers. Payment goes from the customers to Hong Kong, Custom, uh, payment then goes to the suppliers. And the beauty of this is that there's a direct shipment going to your customers. Now, why is this valid, especially now? And why am I bringing this up now, particularly for UK companies? Is because of Brexit. I am seeing the difficulties of UK companies 
sourcing and procuring in Asia, bringing goods to the UK, which then have to be distributed back into the EU. A nightmare. I've seen it. So not only is there a global supply chain issue because of the pandemic, but with Brexit, this is just emphasize this even more as a difficulty. And what I've noticed is that a lot of um, UK companies are setting up subsidiaries in the European Union to cater to that. You could also set up something in Hong Kong as an alternative, right? And the beauty of this structure is you are basically saying to your customers, you know, the, you know, the goods are manufactured in Asia, right? So if they're manufactured in Asia, just to let you know, we also have an office in Asia that where we are centralizing all the shipments that are going to be going to you. So, you know, you don't have to work with us in the UK anymore or with the US anymore or wherever. You can work directly with our Hong Kong subsidiary. Right now, obviously, the key thing here is checking with your UK tax advisors, your US tax advisors, your German tax advisors that this structure becomes financially tax optimized, okay? We don't want to incur, we, we want to save, right? That's our goal. Our goal is to make sure that we're creating the structure to maintain the happiness of our customers, but we're also creating the structure to make money. <laughs> Otherwise, what's the point in it, right? Now, the beauty of Hong Kong is that under a, a profit of 2 million Hong Kong dollars, you only pay 8.25% profits tax. Um, and then thereafter, it goes to 16.5% profits tax, which is, again, it's not a lot when you compare it to other jurisdictions around the world. Okay. Now let's see the dynamic of it. How does it physically work? Okay. Um, so the goals of the direct import program, and let me rephrase that, the goals of setting up this Hong Kong company is ultimately to source from Asia, resell to your home country, but more importantly, to sell direct to third-party destinations. If you've got large retailers like Tesco, Target, Walmart, then these companies can buy directly from your Hong Kong company and they will get the direct shipments. So by large customers, I am talking about the very large retailers that are out there. Another reason or another goal that you want to do is you want to create a centralized sourcing function in Asia. Okay. Um, now I'm going to give you a bit of a case study. Having a client in Latin America right now, he was actually thinking about this direct import program because they feel that from Latin America, they cannot fathom the possibility of all of the types of manufacturers in Asia where pricing will be much, much lower than let's say the US or Europe or Africa. But being in Latin America, it's, just, it's not accessible to them. They don't know who to contact. They don't have that network. So it's a matter of centralizing that sourcing function in Asia where you have a team of people who can figure that out, find these new manufacturers. And again, it might not just be in China, it might be throughout the Asian region. It might also be that because you have these large customers, these retailers that will have very specific terms and conditions, you might have to have better control over quality, meaning you might be sick and tired of outsourcing, blah, 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 outsourcing the quality functions to SGS, to, to all these other providers. And you might wanna bring that in in-house with specialized qualified individuals who you can rely better on to check the quality. You might need better control over receipts and payments. Again, if you've got your head office handling all of that, you know, there's time zone issues. There might be language barriers because a lot of these manufacturers maybe don't really speak that much English. You want better control over receipts and payments and you want to centralize that in one location. And probably the most critical is you want to sell on a FOB Asia terms basis, again, which allows you to sell direct to your large customers and provides benefits to your large customers. The key feature about the direct import program, i.e. the key feature of setting up this Hong Kong company to centralize your sourcing and procurement functions is the fact that in Hong Kong, you can use corporate service providers who act as your administration arm. Now, it's not that these service providers are acting as buying agents. 
these service providers are acting as administrators to your Hong Kong company, doing all of the paperwork for the transactions. So they're not necessarily finding suppliers, they're not finding customers, they're not finding logistics, logistics agents, warehousing agents. What they are doing is, and let me go back to the diagram, they're doing all of that paperwork from purchase orders, invoices, payments, trade financing, and they're going to be talking to the administrative departments of your suppliers, the administrative departments of your customers, the administrative departments of your bank, the administrative departments of your um, logistics providers. They are handling the administrative work of these trade transactions. So when you are building this team, you are only building a team of core individuals, which might be just one or two people, right? Who are fixated on supplier network, maintaining relationships, negotiation and pricing, potentially on quality control. And you might need somebody on the customer side. I, I don't know. That, that has to be evaluated whether that relationship remains with HQ or whether that will start being developed locally in, in, in that office in Hong Kong, or like I said, in Singapore, right? So again, you still have low fixed costs. You've got, you're minimizing your investment risk and you're focusing on the trade transactions, okay? Now, how does Woodburn help its clients? And I put Woodburn here again, because, hey, I'm gonna toot my own horn, but you can also look at other corporate service providers, right? There are thousands of us out there who offer this solution in Hong Kong, okay? Mind you, they, there are also thousands of service providers who offer this solution in Singapore, okay? So what we do is, again, all the administrative functions, right? Helping you to sell FOB Asia or X Warehouse through the documentation. Managing letters of credit and trade financing through the banks in Hong Kong. Handling all the trade documentation and liaising with the vendors in Asia and liaising with your customers abroad. Addressing quality concerns with suppliers. That's a bit hard for us to do, um, especially if the goods are not being transited in Hong Kong, which in many in instances wouldn't be. So that has to be still evaluated. And then obviously, if you are trying to take advantage of the tax regime in Hong Kong, we help you to formulate a structure where either you can pay 0% profits tax because your business is considered as offshore, or you pay 8.25% profits tax if your <clears throat> uh, profitability is under 2 million Hong Kong dollars. Obviously, if it goes higher than that, it would go at 16.5%. Another thing you have to think about when you're structuring this company is where are those individuals going to be based? Are they going to be based in Hong Kong? Would it be more advantage, advantageous that they are based in a jurisdiction where the majority of suppliers are? That is something that has to be evaluated, okay? What you will hear from Daisy on Wednesday from the Hong Kong Trade Development Council is obviously Hong Kong's location is optimal, but I don't wanna put that on anybody's choice. You need to evaluate where your supplier network is and where it's critical to then have people on the ground. So how does the program work? In terms of Woodburn, what we do is we look at what is existing today, right? Where are your suppliers? Where is your network? And who do you want to sell to? Who, who are your customers? Who do you want to do direct shipments to? Okay, we need to analyze all of these various components to create a company that is going to bring you advantages and not disadvantages, okay? So we need to understand what you, your current model is understand who your suppliers are, who your customers are, where are they, um, what are the current terms of trade that you've negotiated and how that can be then updated, right? We then incorporate your Hong Kong company. Remember, it is your Hong Kong company. It is your subsidiary, okay? And the advantage is it can operate within our office because in Hong Kong, you can set up companies with a virtual registered office address, which becomes Woodburn's address, and we can assist you with the day-to-day -day running of that Hong Kong company. We are basically managing and administering that Hong Kong company. This Hong Kong company is receiving orders directly from retail customers. It's handling all the commercial matters in terms of receipts, invoicing, accounting, banking. And it's helping you in the head office to manage that supply chain and to pivot at any point that you need to pivot in because of circumstances like the pandemic. All right. 
Now, again, for me, the reason why you would set up this type of program, why you would set up this type of company is because in the eyes of your customer, you want to be considered as an Asian exporter, right? What does that mean? It means that you are le leveraging off of your designs, your products, your retail network, and your supply network, right? And it's giving you this opportunity to sell into potentially new markets to new retailers that you never thought possible because of situations like if you're a UK company like Brexit, okay? So it's giving you that opportunity to, again, expand your reach. Now, I, I, if you've been on my webinars previously, you will know that I talk a lot about scaling up. We all want to scale up. And the goal is how do we do that, right? How do we gain more clients, all right? Now you're scaling up might be, I wanna sell into China. I'm gonna to touch on that. But let's think first of all that you wanna to sell to, I don't know, Mexico. You wanna to sell to Australia. You wanna to sell to Africa. You wanna to sell to all these different other countries besides your own, okay? And you might already started doing that, but now you have the ability to stand up and say, we are an Asian exporter. Design is UK made, okay? That's what people want. They want UK designed products, but that are manufactured in Asia to lower the cost and we can sell to you globally through our Asian hub. Again, I wanna reemphasize something here. Hong Kong or Singapore or whatever, this program won't work if you don't talk to your tax advisors in your own home jurisdiction to make sure that all of this makes sense, okay? Everybody has to be on the same, same playing field. We all have to be in agreement how to structure this most effectively for you. It's, it is a tailor-made program, okay? So you've got to keep that in mind. Now, again, the key thing here is that, or the key advantages here really are that your new markets can be anywhere in the world. I'm gonna to touch on how China works in a minute. Um, you can sell FOB Asian port. Goods can be shipped directly to the large customers. It frees up capital and inventory, which might otherwise be held up in warehouses. If you are in the UK, it might prevent you from dealing with customs clearances and then export from the UK to other jurisdictions. So I just want to highlight that as well. Okay. Now, the benefits of the program or the benefits of having this Hong Kong company is the corporate tax rates, is the corporate tax regime in Hong Kong. Um, where again, as I said earlier, if your uh, profitability, your net profit is under 2 million Hong Kong dollars, you're looking at 8.25% tax rate, corporate tax rate. If you're looking at um, over 2 million, it's at 16.5%. If you're structuring your business that it is considered as offshore, you can apply for offshore tax exemption, which means your profit tax rate is at 0%, okay? Um, compare that to Singapore, compare that to other jurisdictions and see if that's gonna be a value to you, right? Again, flexibility. Your clients now have the ability to choose whether they buy from the FOB Asia or Xworks. Again, the advantage is that you can reduce the amount of inventory that's tied up in your warehouse because you are selling direct. It frees up capital. Now, if you are selling on FOB sales terms, it means that you're most likely gonna be using letters of credit, which is again, something that is a positive because it's freeing up significant capital financing inventory before any payment is made. And Hong Kong is renowned as a financial hub where you have the ability to get local letters of credit and trade financing through the Hong Kong companies, okay? Is it difficult to open a Hong Kong bank account? Yes, but once you get past that hurdle, um, basically it's difficult to open bank accounts anywhere in the world currently. But once you get past that hurdle, then you have this ability of getting local letters of credit, getting trade financing through the Hong Kong company. And obviously if you structure this business with you being the head office and that being an, an, an actual subsidiary and you're using the same bank so you've got an existing relationship in your home jurisdiction and you're using the same bank then in Hong Kong, then it helps a lot in terms of negotiating these trade financing deals, all right? <clears throat> then because everything is transaction-based, right? The cost of administering and maintaining this Hong Kong subsidiary 
is driven way down because you don't have large fixed overhead costs, okay? Again, you are transferring a lot of the work that is in your head office by doing these trade transactions into the subsidiary where you can outsource most of the administrative functions and just have key personnel that are doing the actual supplier network, customer network, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And then for me, the most important is control and transparency and language, right? Communication. By the fact that you are outsourcing these administrative functions to uh, an organization who's locally on the ground, first of all, you don't have language and time zone issues because all of the administrative functions are going to be happening in the local languages, right? Um, you don't have to hire your own team to do that, right? So, you know, you're outsourcing the work to a provider that's been doing this for 35 odd years um, versus building a team where you don't know these new employees and you're not 100% sure if they're going to do things right, right? You basically want to set up this program and from day one, it needs to be automatically operational. You want things to flow smoothly, swiftly, quickly, that you have control, you have transparency over what's going on. All right. There's low risk because of there's less financial burden, right? Growth. Now, for me, again, this is the biggest. Why are we doing this? Why am I offering you this program? Why am I telling you this program exists? Why am I telling you this business model exists? Is because we all want to scale up and grow, right? And times have changed. China is not the only country in the world that does manufacturing. That has expanded throughout Asia. And how do we maintain that network of suppliers that are throughout Asia? And then there are global political situations that are occurring like Brexit, like the government situation in the US, where we need to be able to create efficient structures that we can sell. Well, first of all, we can expand our customer base and that we can sell direct and not be dependent about bringing product back to us when we have customs issues and border control issues. Okay. And obviously, it's all about how you tweak the words. How do you tweak the message that you want to send out to your customers? Do you want to become an Asian supplier? You can if you've got this subsidiary in place. Obviously, you can also if you set up your own manufacturing facility, but that's going to another level. Do you want to be considered as an Asian supplier? What would be the advantages of being considered as an Asian supplier? Do you want to offer your products globally to retailers that are throughout the world? Do you want to be able to tell your customers you can buy FOB Asian uh, base or X works? These are questions you guys all have to answer. More importantly is, do you guys want to grow? Do you guys want to scale up? Again, we're talking about procurement and sourcing from a global perspective, right? And using Hong Kong as that base to expand on that, okay? <clears throat> so these are questions that you have to ask. Now, again, when I talk about China, I talk about this. And when I talk about Hong Kong, I'm talking about this as well. Where do you wanna place your focus? Do you wanna place your focus on growth? Or do you want to place your focus on administra administration? Okay. The beauty of having this Hong Kong company is the fact that the administration is taken away from you. You're not even going to be doing it in your head office. Whether that means you downsize your head office, I don't know. You have to weigh out that balance. Okay. But what I want people to be focusing on, what I want leaders and managers currently in today's world to be focusing on is growth, is scaling up is expanding their horizon to new customers, new clients, and knowing how to do that from Asia. All right? So that, those are the main benefits that I, I really wanna focus on. So that's basically what we call the direct import program. It's setting up this Hong Kong company, this Hong Kong subsidiary that becomes this vehicle for you to consolidate your whole supplier network and gain new momentum with new customers globally. Sounds good. I think it sounds good. I don't know what you guys think, but from my perspective, it sounds pretty good. And again, you don't have to use Hong Kong. 
like I said, you should really be evaluating where your supplier network is. And, you know, Singapore might be a better location there. There are thousands of us service providers who offer these options, guys. I'm not the only one. Um, so definitely talk to more than one to understand how the dynamics work within the organization. Okay. Now, sourcing and procurement. Nobody else is going to be talking on this about this this week, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the most common pitfalls when sourcing in Asia. Um, and highlighting a little bit what we can and cannot do right now because borders are being shut, all right? So um, as is typical with my China roadmap, the same applies when you're sourcing and when you're procuring in Asia. You need proper preparation and you need research. You need to research, okay? And this is a lot of work, which is why I say, this is not something that an outsource provider is going to be doing. This is something where you might need to hire somebody who does this work for you. Um, I think this work cannot be done from the head office, quite honestly. I think you need to be locally here and have that network. You can obviously work with organizations like the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, who this is their main job, is to help you build this network of suppliers. You can obviously use pages like Alibaba, but how reliable are they? You'll have to go to point two in terms of due diligence and vetting. So if I would say, where would you need a headcount? Probably in this work, okay? The proper preparation and research. When you're sourcing in Asia, you need to be really well prepared, okay? You have a detailed, um, you, have, you have to have a detailed procurement sourcing strategy in place so that you are able to find the best suppliers for your products, for your designs, all right? And how to do that is you need to do market research on your own product so that you know pricing requirements, you know what kind of testing requirements are, are required at the point of sale. So if you're expanding your global customer base and you are importing directly from Asia to, I don't know, Mexico, what are the testing requirements for your specific product as, you're, as they're being imported into Mexico, right? So I know in China, when you're importing electric, um, electrical products, you have to get the three C certifications, right? What's that for the other jurisdictions, okay? When you are speaking to suppliers, you need to, and I know people are like nervous about giving so many details and da da da, da but if you don't give details and you don't give enough details, how do you know that they can actually do it, right? You have to give details about packaging, about quality, about quantity in order to get accurate pricing and that you don't, do this back and forth communication, which is so annoying, right? You send one sentence saying, um, I don't know, order is, I don't know, 1,000 pieces. You go back, comes price, and you say, oh, whoops, made a mistake. Actually, it's 10,000 pieces, because you're like, oh, that 1,000 price, price for 1,000 is good. Just be honest, be direct, get stuff done, right? You don't have to do this back and forth communication all the time. And some people might disagree with me. I'm, I'm a... Yeah, uh, just brash, get it done, let's discuss, all right? Then you've got to do your due diligence on these suppliers. And this is again where maybe you need somebody on the ground to be doing this. And obviously, if you've got a network of suppliers throughout Asia, and you've got one person that's based out of Hong Kong, for example, <clears throat> with the current border controls, they also can't get anywhere. So there are issues. Um, in complete agreement with that. There are issues. Um, hopefully within the next six to 12 months, all of that will slowly be changing, but um, you have to do your due diligence. You have to make sure the factories exist. You have to make sure the factories are legitimate. We have had cases where suppliers have posted up on Alibaba and then people have made orders and then all of a sudden communication stops, no more phone calls. No more emails being answered, uh, all of this type of stuff, right? Um, so we have to vet them. Now, one thing that's important for you to know is that you don't just have to vet whether their factories are legitimate. What you can also do is do background checks on their business licenses. So if you're reaching out to suppliers, ask them for a copy of their business licenses. And what you can do is contact or service provider locally in that jurisdiction 
to do a background check with the equivalent of the Ministry of Commerce to see if they truly exist. And are they designated as a factory or as a manufacturing company, right? Don't forget that you need to maintain relationships with the suppliers, either by phone, by Skype, by WeChat, by Zoom. You have to build a personal connection. So it's not just a random communication here and there. It's continuous maintenance of communication to build up that personal relationship, which I just want to say, you don't have to do face-to-face. -face. You can do this now. This, this is why are we being shy about phones and WeChat and all of that? We've had to pivot. We've had to get into that. All right. Now, quotations are important. How do you know that a quotation is reasonable? Well, don't just contact one supplier, right? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. You should be contacting a multiple array of suppliers, producing that product and getting a benchmarking on what they are saying the price is. And I just put that sentence there. I didn't highlight it in red, I should have, but I just want you to be aware to not confuse the lowest price with the best price, okay? It's important to do your benchmarking. And you might be confused by what I mean by that. The lowest price does not necessarily mean that the product is of highest quality. The lowest price doesn't mean anything. You need to actually look at so much more than pricing when you're negotiating with these suppliers. You gotta look at lead times. You gotta look at their history. Do they have references? All right. What you don't want to get into is a situation where suppliers give you the lowest rock bottom price, you pay a deposit, and then suddenly you say, oh, whoops, you know, we're having supply chain difficulties, raw material prices have gone up. Well, now we have to increase our pricing. And you've already paid a deposit. And you're put in a situation where you've got to accept it. So if you don't also know what the current market trends are with the raw materials of your products and what they are looking like, um, I'll give you an example. My husband works for Ferrero and uh, they look at hazelnut pricing daily for the Nutella products, daily. So you've got to look at these commodities and make sure you're also aware of what the current global situation is on those raw materials. You need to be able to monitor your suppliers in Asia. And again, this is probably one of the functions of having somebody who works for you, that they do that, right? Because you don't want to run into these traps, all right? What we want is that we work with suppliers that are, again, as reliable as possible with their pricing, with their quality control, with their shipment times, their lead times, okay? Now, the last one is providing detailed product packaging and shipment information, okay? What, and this is also pertaining to the testing requirements that are stipulated by the countries where you are selling to and where you are shipping to. What are the packaging details? What product labeling details? Are there specific carton measurements that you have to be aware of? Um, you know, what you don't want to get into a situation is, is that you don't inform the suppliers. And then actually there's one specific detail that causes you to either cancel the order, rework the order, uh, recall the order or whatever it might be. Okay, we have to be getting into the nitty gritty details here. Last but not least, we have to monitor production, quality and shipping arrangements. And again, this is another function of probably what this person is going to be doing is monitoring the production, the quality of shipment, maintaining these relationships, maintaining that communication so that mistakes can be avoided during the manufacturing process. You wanna be on the ball. And again, then it comes to the point where where is this person gonna be located? Where are the majority of your manufacturers? so that they have the ability to travel there, right? You want to do the quality control. You want a QC team that is um, experts, whether it's electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, whatever it might be in the products that you're producing. Of course, you can outsource those functions, but at some point you may wanna bring them in as well. So just to finish off today's presentation, we're gonna look at the key considerations when sourcing in China and or Asia, all right? One is the lack of control and communication, which has been blatantly um, seen during COVID. It's turning a blind eye to a lot of things, unethical situations, unsustainable organizations, et cetera. 
inexperienced staff not knowing how to do business in Asia, not knowing how to negotiate with suppliers, not knowing how to um, discuss some quality control issues. You need somebody who is strong, determined to be able to have these discussions, right? Cultural differences. Now, obviously, if you are expanding your reach, not just for China, but into other Asian countries like Vietnam, you need to know what the culture is like there in terms of negotiation, right? When you are going to manufacturing sites in China, I mean, these are well-developed, very mature areas. You're in Vietnam, and I've done this on a holiday, actually. You go to, you go to uh, manufacturing zones in Vietnam, and you're on these little roads that are so unstable with rice paddies on either side of you. I mean, from a shipping perspective and a transportation perspective, there has to be delays. I, just, I, I can't foresee it not happening. And obviously things may have changed since my ho last holiday there, but it's just to know how, how do you do business in these different jurisdictions? What are the cultural differences that you need to be aware of? You need to know your supplier base. You need to do your due diligence. You need to bet them. Now, if your suppliers are also using subcontractors, you need to be able, you need to have that transparency and that control as well. You've got to be aware of your end clients knowing your supplier network because then they can needle you out. I mean, unless your design is so unique and it's patented, patented, they can needle you out, right? So it's important to make sure that when you are doing any forms of transaction that your end clients aren't aware of who your suppliers and manufacturers are. In the various Asian jurisdictions, you've got to be aware of government interaction, right? And the extent of the government interaction how that might affect your business, whether that is in relation to obtaining raw materials or their um, um, higher tariffs on raw materials being imported. I mean, there's so many different customs regulations you need to be aware of. It's important to have that knowledge base. And then put not least, I mean, there are a lot more reasons, but I've put 10 up here. But last but not least, which I think is also very important is the abnormal or unexpected methods of payment. So for example, you think you're dealing with a company and all of a sudden you're asked to pay a deposit to somebody's personal bank account. And you haven't actually properly vetted the company and you're not really noticing that you're sending money to a personal bank account, right? So you need to be aware of these things as well. Um, and maybe there's nothing wrong with it, but just ask those questions so that you're protecting your business. You're not losing out on money, right? So that's the end of today's presentation. Um, that's all about the direct import program, procuring sourcing in China. So I promised you that I would talk about how to sell into China if you are procuring and sourcing in China or in Asia. Um, if you are selling, if you would like to sell into China and you have consumer products, probably the easiest method is doing, um, okay. If you don't have an entity in China, the only option you have is that the goods are exported from China. The beauty of it is that they can go into a bonded logistics park that is on mainland Chinese territory. They are considered as being exported. The suppliers will obtain their um, VAT refunds. The goods, once they're in the bonded logistics park are owned, for example, by your Hong Kong company. And then they are re-imported to customers in China or through the cross-border e-commerce model, okay? You just need to be aware of the customs regulation on your products at the point of importation but at least they're not leaving the country, okay? They're staying on the mainland territory. Alternatively, you can also then set up your own entity in China, which buys from the suppliers and sells to the customers, whether that's wholesale, retail, e-commerce, whatever it might be. We call that domestic business, okay? Those are the two solutions. Or naturally, you can use an import-export agent that is based in mainland China that does that buying and selling on your behalf, although you won't have as much control and transparency over those transactions. So that's the selling into China part. Um, guys, if you've got any questions, please insert them into the chat box. That is the end of today's session. Tomorrow, like I said, we're gonna be talking about logistics, then on Wednesday about Hong Kong as a sourcing hub, and then Thursday about FX exchange mitigation. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the direct impact program from Asia using Hong Kong and how you can implement that into your own structure, you can reach out to me. I'm just, oops, I'm just going to 
copy and paste my details in the chat box so everybody has it. Give me one moment. Uh, I'm gonna send that to everybody. There we go, you've got my details. Um, and if you've got any questions, please add them in. All right. I like that. Kim, I, Kim, whenever you come on, you always, um, you always uh, add your comments. I like that. Kim actually made a, com a comment that as he is developing the sourcing and procurement strategy for Asia, um, he is differentiating between lowest price and lowest overall cost, which I think is very interesting. Thank you, Emma. Appreciate you joining in today. Again, if there are no questions that are popping in, I guess it was very, very straightforward. Like I said, if you don't wanna discuss on today's presentation, you don't have to. You can set up a call directly with me. You can email me as you wish, and we can have a one, um, one, you know, a thought, a thought, uh, a discovery call together to discuss it further. So again, just, just to reemphasize, tomorrow we're going to talk about supply chain models for exporting from Asia, the challenges and the opportunities. That's going to be very much from a logistical standpoint. On Wednesday, we've got Daisy from the Hong Kong TDC who's coming in to talk about Hong Kong Asia Sourcing Hub, and Isabel from Ebury who's coming in on Thursday to talk about how to mitigate currency risk when trading with China. So please, please do sign up. You can do that at woodburnglobal.com slash events to be able to join. Um, and again, I'll just stay on for a couple of minutes in case you guys have any questions. I'd like to thank you very much for joining me. I hope to see you again in, during the rest of the week. Take care and goodbye.